Hi, and welcome again to my series of videos for Physical Chemistry 2. For the past two videos, we've looked at different types of crystals and how we can use crystallography to determine their structure. Today I want to tell you about the energy inherent in a crystal because of its unique structure. Back in the Physical Chemistry 1 course, we looked at bond enthalpies. We saw that these enthalpies are in the range of a few hundred kilojoules per mole, and they represent the energy that would be needed to break the bond in question. However, one thing that you might have noticed is that all the bonds in this chart are covalent bonds. They take place between two non-metal atoms. Why aren't ionic bonds included in the chart? Well, it turns out that we determine bond enthalpies for ionic bonds in a much different way than for covalent bonds. The bond enthalpies for covalent bonds are determined by taking averages based on the enthalpies of formation of hundreds of different organic molecules that contain those bonds. However, that's not a good way of determining the strengths of ionic bonds, because the strength of the bonds can be very different depending on the lattice structure. You might remember that the unit cell of a crystal can have several different shapes. This lattice structure determines which atoms are connected to one another in the crystal, and the geometry of the bonds around the atoms. Different lattice structures can result in bonds with very different enthalpies. For example, zinc sulfide can form two very different crystals called wurzite and zinc blend. Wurzite has a hexagonal crystal structure, whereas zinc blend has a cubic lattice. As you might guess, these crystals have very different properties, and the bonds that hold the atoms together have different enthalpies. It wouldn't be a good approximation to simply use an average of bond enthalpies, as we can for covalent bonds. So, what do we do instead? Instead of the bond enthalpy, we usually measure the thermodynamic stability of an ionic crystal using what's called the lattice energy, which we symbolize as the letter capital U. The lattice energy is the enthalpy of the reaction in which gas phase ions react to form a crystal. For example, suppose we have a crystal of the ionic compound magnesium phosphate, which occurs in the mineral newberryite, where it has an orthorhombic crystal lattice. We can imagine starting with the gas phase ions of magnesium and phosphate and combining them to form the solid crystal, which would give us this reaction. The enthalpy of this reaction would be the lattice energy. There are several things to notice about this reaction. First of all, this is actually the opposite of the kind of reaction we looked at when we were thinking about bond enthalpies for covalent bonds. For example, consider the bond enthalpy for the oxygen-oxygen double bond. That bond enthalpy corresponds to the enthalpy of a reaction where we break the bond so we start with an oxygen molecule and end up with two separate oxygen atoms. On the other hand, for the lattice energy, we're looking at a reaction in which the bond is formed, not broken. But breaking a bond requires energy, which makes it an endothermic process. So bond enthalpies have positive values. On the other hand, Forming a bond, it is an exothermic process, so lattice energies usually have negative values. Also, notice that the reaction reflecting the bond enthalpy results in two neutral atoms, whereas the lattice energy reaction involves ions, not neutral atoms. That's because bond enthalpies involve covalent bonds, in which the electrons in the bond are shared, so each atom in the bond get some of the electrons in the bond, and the result is two neutral atoms. On the other hand, the lattice energy always involves ionic bonds, so the bond results by combining an anion and a cation. Finally, notice that the reaction represented by the lattice energy would actually be a very difficult reaction to achieve in a lab. In this example, we need gas phase ions of magnesium and phosphate, and those would be extremely reactive and would require very high temperatures and low pressures in order to create them. What does that mean? Well, unlike the bond enthalpies of covalent bonds, we don't get the lattice energies for ionic bonds directly from experiment. 
Instead, we use an indirect method that we discussed back in Physical Chemistry 1. I'm referring to Hess's law. As you might remember, Hess's law says that if a complex reaction can be broken down into a series of steps, the enthalpy of the overall reaction is just a sum of the enthalpies of each of the steps. So, in other words, what we need to do is find a series of reactions that we can add together in order to arrive at the overall reaction represented by the lattice energy. That means we need to look at chemical reactions that have enthalpies that we already know and that involve either the crystal or the ions that are used to form it. For example, here's the reaction in which aqueous ions combine to form the solid crystal we seek. As you can see, this reaction is very similar to the one that corresponds to the lattice energy. In fact, the only difference is that the reactants in this equation are aqueous ions instead of gas phase ions. Notice that unlike the lattice energy reaction, this reaction is very easy to perform in a simple laboratory experiment. In fact, you've probably done similar reactions in your chemistry courses as early as general chem. It's just a simple precipitation reaction, and its enthalpy is easy to measure. In the case of this reaction, it's 195 kilojoules per mole. So, in order to use Hess's law, we now just need to find reactions that connect the gas phase ions to the aqueous ions. And there are such reactions. Consider these reactions, in which we take gas phase ions and place them in water so that they become aqueous. These are called hydration reactions and the enthalpies of hydration are known for many different ions. For example, the two hydration reactions we're looking at right now have these enthalpies. So, now we have reactions that connect gas phase ions to aqueous ions, and another reaction that connects the aqueous ions to the solid crystal. That means we can now use Hess's law to find the enthalpy of the overall reaction, and that'll give us the lattice energy. Remember, to use Hess's law, we need to rearrange the subreactions so that the reactants and products appear on the correct sides of the reaction, and the coefficients add up to give us the coefficients in the overall reaction. For example, in the overall reaction, we want the gas phase ions to appear on the left side of the reaction. They already are that way in our subreactions, so we don't need to change the direction of those reactions. However, we do need to change the coefficients. To do that, we'll multiply the reaction involving magnesium by 3, and the one involving phosphate by 2. When we do this, we also need to multiply the enthalpies of the reactions by the same amount. We also need the solid magnesium phosphate to appear on the right side of the reaction. The subreaction already has magnesium phosphate on that side, so we can leave that one alone. That means we're now ready to add the reactions together. Notice that when we do so, there are several ions that appear on both sides of the reaction. That means those ions will cancel out. For example, three aqueous magnesium ions appear on the left side in this reaction and on the right side in this one, so those will drop out. The same is true for the two aqueous phosphate ions here and here. When we add the enthalpies of the three reactions together, we get negative 9,487 kilojoules per mole. That makes this a very exothermic reaction. That's a common result for the lattice energy. Ionic crystals are very thermodynamically stable, so they have lattice energies that are usually large and negative. This is the general approach we take when we want to calculate a lattice energy using Hess's law. We use subreactions consisting of a precipitation reaction and hydration reactions. Now let's look more closely at some of the subreactions we just used in Hess's law. We saw these two reactions and said that they're hydration reactions. But what's really happening here? Well, imagine we have a cation in the gas phase with a positive charge Z 
If we suddenly place this in a sample of water, what will happen? Well, as you know, a water molecule is a dipole, so it has a negative and a positive side. That means that the negative ends of the water molecules will be attracted to the cation, and they'll move so that they surround the cation. When we write the AQ for aqueous next to a cation in a chemical reaction, that's what we're really saying. The cation has a large number of water molecules electrostatically bound to it, often two or three layers deep. So when we use an enthalpy of hydration in Hess's law in order to find the lattice energy, that's actually the enthalpy of this process of surrounding the cation with water molecules that are attracted to it. Sometimes we can look up this enthalpy in a reference book. But what if we can't? There are many ions whose enthalpies of hydration haven't been published. In that case, there's a good way to get a rough estimate of the enthalpy of hydration. It's called the Latimer equation, and it's given by this formula. Here, Z is the charge on the cation, and R is the radius of the cation in picometers. The resulting enthalpy of hydration we get is in kilojoules per mole. For example, suppose we're interested in an aluminum ion, which has a radius of 53 picometers. In that case, we can plug the radius and charge into the Latimer equation, which gives us this. When we solve the equation, we find that the enthalpy of hydration is approximately negative 5,321 kilojoules per mole. The same process takes place if we have an anion instead of a cation. This time, it's the positive ends of the water molecules that are attracted to the ion, and again, we can get a couple of layers of water molecules surrounding the ion. Just as with the cation, we can use an equation to estimate the enthalpy of hydration if we can't get the enthalpy from a reference book. However, this time the equation for anions is different than the one for cations, and it's this. Once again, R is the radius of the anion in picometers, and Z is the anion's charge. So, now we have a way to determine the enthalpies of hydration, and we can use those enthalpies for the hydration reactions when we calculate the lattice energy using Hess's law. But notice that there's still another sub-reaction in our procedure for using Hess's law. It's the precipitation reaction in which the aqueous ions form the solid compound we're interested in. What if we don't have the enthalpy of that equation and can't measure it in the lab for some reason? In that case, we wouldn't use Hess's law at all. Instead, we'd use this equation to estimate the lattice energy. In this equation, Z plus and Z minus are the charges on the cation and anion, and R is the sum of the radii on the two ions. What about N? N is called the average Born exponent, after the German physicist Max Born. We met him back in video 27 when we talked about the Born-Oppenheimer approximation. We get the Born exponent by looking at the electron configurations of the cation and anion. For example, suppose we want to know the lattice energy of the compound manganese 3 oxide. That compound is composed of manganese plus 3 ions and oxygen minus 2 ions. If we write out the electron configuration of manganese, we find that it's 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 4s2, 3d5. To make the manganese 3 ion, we must take away 3 electrons. Remember, we take away electrons from the highest s orbital first, then take away electrons from the end of the electron configuration. So, we take away the 4s electrons, and then one of the 3d electrons. Next, let's do that for the oxygen minus 2 ion. The electron configuration of oxygen is 1s2, 2s2, 2p4. To make the oxygen 2 anion, we add 2 electrons to the last orbital, which gives us 2p6.
So, if we look at the two electron configurations, we can see that the highest value of n in the manganese ion is 3, and the highest value in the oxygen configuration is 2. To get the Born exponent, we use this chart. Based on this, the Born exponent for manganese is 9, and the Born exponent for oxygen is 7. That makes the average Born exponent 8. So that's the value that we use in the equation. Now we can plug our values into the equation. z plus is 3, z minus is negative 2, and n is 8. We get r by adding the two ionic radii, which gives us 204 picometers. When we solve the equation, we get a lattice energy of negative 3,575 kilojoules per mole. It turns out that the lattice energy of manganese 3 oxide actually has been measured. So how does the real lattice energy compare to the value we just calculated? The real value is negative 15,090.5 kilojoules per mole. That's really far from our predicted value, and that's a reason why we usually wouldn't use this equation to determine the lattice energy if we could do it using tabulated values of the hydration energy and the precipitation enthalpy. But why was our calculated value so far off? The problem has to do with the way the atoms in a crystal are bonded together. For example, here's part of a sodium chloride crystal. In a single sodium chloride molecule, each sodium is bonded to one chlorine. But when we make a crystal out of it, look what we get. Here's a larger portion of a sodium chloride crystal with different atoms given different colors. The red sodium is bonded to six green chlorines, one on each side. And each chlorine is bonded to six sodiums. That means that any given sodium feels attracted to each of the six neighboring chlorines. It also feels repulsion from each of the 12 blue sodiums that are slightly farther away. A bit farther than that, the sodium feels attraction to the next farthest set of chlorine atoms, shown here in pale green. It feels repulsion from the next set of sodiums a little further away, and so on. The crystal consists of millions of layers of sodium and chlorine atoms stretching in every direction, each of which exerts an attraction or repulsion on every other atom in the crystal. In reality, only atoms that are relatively close to a given sodium or chlorine have a noticeable attraction or repulsion for it. But those forces are important, and they have a significant effect on the lattice energy. For that reason, we need to modify this equation slightly by adding this factor, which is called the Madelung constant, after the German physicist Erwin Madelung. The Madelung constant takes into account the attractions and repulsions that atoms in a crystal exert on each other from a distance. As you might guess, the Madelung constant is different depending on the geometry of the crystal. For example, the Madelung constant for manganese 3 oxide is 4.1719. If we plug that into our equation, along with the other data we saw earlier, we find that the lattice energy is negative 14,915 kilojoules per mole. That's much closer to the real experimental value, which we saw is negative 15,090.5 kilojoules per mole. For that reason, we should always use this equation with the Madelung constant in it, rather than the equation without the Madelung constant. As I mentioned a moment ago, the Madelung constant depends on the structure of the crystal. And the structure of the crystal depends on the coordination number of the ion. That is, how many bonds each ion forms to its neighboring ions. And how do we determine that? Well, the ions will pack together as closely as possible, and the best way to do that depends on the radii of the cation and the anion. To find out the best geometry, we need to take the ratio between the two radii. 
We put the smaller radius in the numerator so that we'll always get a number smaller than 1. For example, we saw that manganese 3 has a radius of 64 picometers, and oxygen has a radius of 140 picometers. That makes the ratio between them 0 0.4571. Now, to find the Madelung constant, we'll use this table. This table is separated into four sections. These rows apply to compounds with the general formula mx, where m is the metal and x is the nonmetal. These apply to compounds with a formula mx2. These have a formula m2x3. And the fourth category is for all other stoichiometries. Manganese 3 oxide has the formula mn2O3, so we'll use the third part of the table. Now we look at the first column, which tells us the ratio between the two radii. We determined a moment ago that the ratio for manganese 3 oxide is 0 0.4571, so we'll use this row. The fourth column over here tells us the value of the Madelung constant for this compound, which is 4.1719, the number that we used in our calculation. Well, that's enough new material for now. In the next video, we'll start our last major topic for the course, which is a closer look at the statistics behind large numbers of molecules. We'll spend several videos talking about that. I hope you'll join me for that. But until then, have a good week.